and I'm there and I'm drunk as all hell. I'm drunk. I might be on some drugs. I'm just high. But even I'm that drunk, I'm still too scared to speak to people. So I explode and I freaking just let rip on this girl. And like I say, man, everyone must have been terrified. Um, Kieran, leave it, man. I remember the way she looked at me. This girl just looked at me like I was the sexiest man on earth. And I was like, whoa, this actually works. I realize that everybody is scared. And if everybody is scared, why not be the person who's actually going to help people overcome their scaredness? So to the man who is watching, I don't know how long you've been following me, maybe for a few weeks, months, couple of years or so. And I wanted to do a video talking about how I got to where I am today because you might see some of the stuff I do and feel like, okay, so this guy's like always been confident or, or, or always been good with women. Not the case at all. Not the case at all. So growing up, man, I was very, very, very shy. Very shy. And the reason for that was because I was always told that there was always something wrong with me. I heard that message so much. I grew up as a black kid surrounded by white people, like going to school, like the only black person in my class, that was usually the case, or living where I grew up, more or less the only black person in the area. And the kids I grew up with, bearing in mind that this is the 80s or 90s, they would often say to me, you're different because you're black. Like I heard that all the time, you're different because you're black. So that was hard. But then also on the weekends I'd be with black people. Now, on the weekends when I'm with black people, the black people I was with on the weekends would say, you're different because you sound like a white person. I got that a lot as well. So when you're constantly being told you're different, it's like, who am I? Where do I belong? Also, I had some like ADHD or something like that as well. And I had loads of energy, hyperactive and things. And I was always in trouble, always in trouble, in trouble with my parents, in trouble at school, whatever. I grew up feeling like I was some sort of horrible, hideous, despicable troll that's the way I felt and I actually remember being like seven or eight and actually saying to myself okay so it, considering I'm so horrible or considering I'm so terrible I'm gonna make life hard for myself like I actually made a decision to punish myself and make life hard which is kind of messed up when you think about it. But anyway, the point is that I grew up like just unable to talk to people. Like I could talk to really close friends or family, but anyone else I just couldn't, man. And people thought I was weird. Like a lot of people thought I was weird, like at school and things like that. And uh, for me, it was like, it wasn't even just like, oh, I can't get girls. I mean, I didn't think I could, but I just couldn't meet people at all, man. At all. <laughs> I was a bit overweight, people used to make fun of that. When I was 14, I started working out. Started building some of this. Here's the thing. By the time I was 15, 16, I more or less looked like this. So I wasn't fat anymore. But even though I wasn't fat, like I still felt the same in here, you know? Still felt the same. I remember I went, when I was 18, I started going to nightclubs with friends. And we'd be going to these clubs like once a week or so. There's a club called Snobs that I went to every freaking week. Now, Snobs had a capacity of about 200 people and everyone knew each other. Like, everybody knew everyone at Snobs. And I'm there and I'm drunk as all hell. I'm drunk. I might be on some drugs. I'm just high. But even I'm that drunk, I'm still too scared to speak to people. I'll talk to people for about four or five minutes and then I'll just back out and leave because I was just scared. Basically, scared. Scared of rejection, scared of looking stupid, scared of whatever. And uh, yeah, man, that was hard. It's like I just go back and I get so wrecked, like so, so, so wrecked. And I would drink, I would just drink to the point of almost oblivion, almost. And I would have, be hungover for days. Like maybe I'd drink and I'd be hungover for like three, four, five days afterwards. Don't feel like myself, you know, feeling depressed and what have you went to uni when i was 19 university college for you americans and when i'm there i'm living in halls of residence i'm with a group of people and they didn't dislike me but they didn't respect me they really didn't my first day of uni i remember trying to be really cool and i'm trying to like we've gone out we've gone to this club 
and we come back and there's girls and there's guys and whatever and I thought to myself okay uni this is where it's all gonna start man this is like the birth of the new me this is where I'm going to create this new life for myself you know this is what I'm gonna do but yeah, I was trying to be really cool, but they all thought I was an idiot because I was just trying way too hard. And it's like I just came across really arrogant. So the girls decided they didn't like me. The guys thought I was stupid. And that really hit my confidence. Now, the truth is I probably could have come back for that, from that. I totally could have come back from that, but it destroyed my confidence. And the truth is I still hadn't really done any work on myself anyway. So in the upcoming weeks and months, I was just in a shell and I felt like I wasn't part of the group. And I suppose I wasn't. And then I started to feel like anxiety in my chest. Total anxiety. Although I didn't know what it was at the time. But what I know is that I just tried to ignore it. And I remember I'd be there playing my PlayStation. It's a PlayStation 2, mind you. Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 3. I was playing that game. I just, I'm playing the game all day just to get away from the feeling in my, in my heart. And... I know that if I actually paid attention to that feeling, if I sat down and actually paid attention to it, I'd have probably broke down and cried. Like, definitely would have done. Definitely. But, you know, I just ignored it. I just ignored it. Anyway, so that builds up and it builds up. And I'm just miserable, man. I'm really miserable. I lived in a shared room with a guy called Stephen. And everyone loved Stephen. Everyone did. And it was kind of hard because on the one hand, we were in the shared room and he was like one of the coolest guys in our little apartment building. So there were always people coming into my room because of him, which was good because it's like I wasn't really on my own. But they only came for him and they only stayed if he was there. So people would knock the door and they'd say, hey, Kieran, is Stephen there? And I'd say no. And they'd go, hmm, all right then, see ya. And they're gone. And that hurt me. Like the fact that I knew, quote unquote, that I was so irreplaceable. Or just, you know, didn't matter. That hurt a lot. Then there was this day when we were all going to go drinking. And, well, we were going to go clubbing, but we were drinking. There's guys and there's girls, we're all in the kitchen. And we get onto the topic of weight. And I say to a girl, I think she looks like she weighs 10 or 10 and a half stone. She starts crying. She's apparently got an issue with her weight. I didn't think that was a heavy amount anyways. She starts crying. Again, everyone's upset with me, Kieran. How could you say that? Blah, blah, blah. Then there's this one girl who was her, her friend. She says, Kieran, you're a fucking arsehole and I could have you killed. That's what she said. And like she said it with venom as well. Like she absolutely just hated me. That set me off massively. And all the anger, all of the pain, all of the misery, the frustration, it came out because it's like everything I do is wrong. Everything. Like nothing I do is ever correct. Everything I do is wrong. These people always hate me. And I'm shouting and I'm screaming and I'm shouting and I'm screaming and probably almost certainly terrified everybody there because they never saw that side of me. I, I had like huge amounts of temper, but I learned to hide it because you don't want to be the angry black man, you know, the angry black man stereotypes. Even though I had tons of temper or anger, I always hid it around people. I mean, I still got a huge temper today, I suppose. But mm. So a lot of people who knew me, like if they didn't know me as a child and they knew me as like an adult, they're like, huh, you temper? Huh. So I explode and I freaking just let rip on this girl and like i say man everyone must have been terrified um kieran leave it man leave it leave it you know pulled out the room and i see a door with a safety glass pane and i punch that door in just anger and i cut through my wrist i don't know if you can see that there huge scar hopefully you can yeah i know yeah i'm sure you can Anyway, huge scar on my wrist. Uh, I lacerate all the nerves and tendons in my right hand. Had to relearn to use my hand. I don't know if you can see, but it's like I can't really straighten this hand properly. I mean, I can if I force it, but I can't use this hand properly at all. Like, you know, the Vulcan thing, live long and prosper, where you, you know, this thing here. Can't do that here. Had to, blood was coming out like a hose. 
like a hose and i mean that like a hose man i was terrified everyone else was terrified i obviously had to go to hospital uh had an operation to reattach the nerves and tendons in my right hand you know it's a funny thing when i did this i couldn't feel anything i couldn't feel a thing it's just like um and there was absolutely no pain whatsoever but i couldn't move my hand at all it's like that signal was just gone anyway yeah, man, I have an operation, reattach my nerves and tendons. Then it took me about a year to relearn the use of my hand, a year. So I had to do everything with my left hand, basically for about a year, everything. Everything with my left hand. And that was really tough, man. And like, to be honest, I started to go into like a pit of depression then. Like I really did. And then i started to find it hard to connect to even the people like people i've known forever you know the way i saw myself really started to change it's funny because before that moment i always thought i was invincible like physically i thought i was i like to tell myself i was that moment showed me that i wasn't man because i couldn't leave my fucking hand and then I started to get brain fog and then it's like I couldn't focus in conversations and like I couldn't remember what the hell I was saying so yeah man I really learn the use of my right hand over the course of a year and this is about the time when I discovered um dating like pickup basically I found an ebook online called double your dating written by a guy called David D'Angelo about 18 19 I remember I come across the advert and the advert says, everything you know about dating is wrong. I was like, really? Everything I know about women is wrong? All right. But he had a free sample of the book. So I read this sample. I don't know how much it was, but I read it and I was like, whoa. Then I bought the book. It was like an e-book. So I buy the e-book. I devoured that e-book over the course of an evening. It was a book. Like it was a book, but it, I was like, whoa. Oh my God, everything I know about women is wrong, cocky and funny. Oh my God, how the hell have I not been listening to what these rappers were saying? Crap. So then I, I got into this stuff, but the thing is back then, it wasn't like there is today. See, like today you got YouTube. So for instance, like you're watching this on YouTube right now. There was no YouTube back then, it's like 2001. So all I had was this book. So I read the book. I mean, I probably could have done a strict Google search and found some other stuff, but yeah, I guess I didn't think it's like I had the book. I read the book again and again and again. And honestly, I thought that what I got in that book was all I needed to know. But that book, great as it was, didn't really speak about the inner game per se. It more told you like specific things to do. And that stuff did actually work. It really did. I remember the first time I went to a club and I said, I said whatever to a girl, you know, I. I said something cocky and funny. I can't even remember what it was. But I remember the way she looked at me. This girl just looked at me like I was the sexiest man on earth. And I was like, whoa, this actually works. Whoa. And I learned this stuff for a bit. And then I ended up getting into a relationship. So now this is the thing inside i'm still the same person i still hate myself i still feel like the world doesn't understand me i'm still scared i'm still lonely i'm still everything it's just that i've learned a few techniques you know a few little techniques to use um in certain situations and they worked but they they didn't come from like a deep inner inner place and because they didn't come from a deep inner place well when i wasn't using the techniques you know i was back to being me and i was still lonely i was still scared i was still everything Ended up uh, getting the girlfriends, like the first girlfriend I ever had. Um, honestly, she was a complete bitch, and she was. Like, she genuinely was. <laughs> she was a bad person. I don't know if she's like this now, because this is almost 20 years ago, but she wasn't great. She really wasn't. But, you know, she was miserable, I was miserable, and together, we were miserable together, you know? Long distance relationship, I'm in that relationship for years shouldn't have been there we argued all the time 
to be honest i made her cry once or tw once or twice she made me cry a lot honestly when she spoke i was either bored like just hearing her talk either bored me or pissed me off because if she wasn't angry she just wasn't interesting and when she was angry she was horrible to be around honestly like in the years I spent with her, I can think of one moment that genuinely made me smile. But this is what you put up with when you're scared of being alone and when you honestly, deep down, don't think you can get anyone else. And the truth is, that's how she felt as well. That's why she stayed with me. I mean, I wasn't great, you know? I wasn't great. We stayed with each other because we were miserable. Funnily enough, I actually left that relationship I'd like to say I left that relationship because I realised that I I deserve better and I kind of did. I mean, I always knew that I needed better, but there was this situation where I thought I might get with another girl and then that gave me the confidence to actually leave this girl. As it happened, I didn't get with that other girl at all, but it is what it is. So anyway, I leave her and it's like I'm single, I'm single. Now, at this point, we're in like 2010 or so and now game we're getting into the modern era now because now we've got youtube and now there's all manner of stuff like rsd was around at this point and there was loads of material about seduction and i dove into it i did but here's the thing i was all about routines so you know there's the inner game and the outer game and anyone who knows me knows that i'm really big on the outer game but the outer game from what i have seen like out of game techniques and they're great and they work don't get me wrong but their purpose is to give the impression of you having a strong in the game so if you walk up to a woman and you use some neg or a disqualifier or whatever and her attraction increases she doesn't go oh this man's used an awesome technique she's like oh wow this is a man who's like got a rock solid like sense of self he's really grounded he's really secure he's really funny he believes in himself she thinks all of that stuff as a result of you using that technique once i realized oh no no let me let me go back a little bit so i had a huge list of stories that i would give to that I would say to women you know because again like i'm hiding from myself you know i don't really like myself i'm not good enough and on my own i'm not enough and like i knew that intrinsically on a deep level i just knew i wasn't enough so what i had to do was i had to hide i had to hide behind stories and that's what i did i had a huge directory of stories in my phone some of them were real things that happened and some were just completely made up but i had a huge directory of stories so i would be out and let's say i meet some girl and like i'm talking to her and then i don't know what to say so i, I would tell her a story i was, i'd like look in my phone it'd be like a oh, dolphin story okay great so then i would tell her the dolphin story and she'd be laughing i like the dolphin story might carry me for about five to ten minutes like who you know it's a story and then she'd be laughing oh okay and then that buy me some time and then i would look at my phone and then tell another story that's what i did you know just hiding you know because if i knew what to say i was good but if i didn't know what to say i was bad it's like you know what i've always been good at public speaking even back in this period even when i was like 17 because public speaking is i'd plan what i was going to say beforehand and then i'd say it and if i knew what i was going to say i've got no problem with like standing on stage in front of 500 people a thousand people and saying it is because i know what i'm going to say but in a conversation you don't know what you're going to say you're just like in that moment you have to come up with something and that was what was hard so yeah man i'm coming up with all of these um i've got all these stories and stuff and that's how i would hide and i ended up seeing some girl i don't know how long i saw her for this happened to me a couple of times actually this didn't just happen once but anyway seeing some girl now what happened was so I've got a list of stories. So let's say for argument's sake, I've got 20 stories for argument's sake. So I'm seeing the girl and then I'm slowly running through my stories. Don't ask me why I didn't just come up with new stories. I Don't ask me why, I'm not sure. But I, over a period of a month or however long it was, I worked my way through all of my stories and then I reach a point where I've actually run out of stories. Then when I've run out of stories, it's me. Then when it's like, oh my God, crap, crap Kieran is it's you I'm freaking out and I go into my head and I'm just being weird again and it's all you know and I, I don't know what to say 
And to the girl who's with me, that must have been the craziest thing in the world for her because this guy he was like really cool, really confident, really whatever. Just did done a complete 180. It's like you've gone from being the most attractive man in the world to the most unattractive because I'm now totally in my head. I'm now totally insecure. I don't know what to say. And I'm just being really weird. And I ended up losing, yeah, I lost a couple of girls, really. And it was just, it was not even just the fact I lost them, but like seeing the change as like they slowly start to disrespect you. And you can see the way that they are towards you just like you see the respect evaporating i remember one time i was with this girl and it actually bothers me to this day now like thinking about this i remember i we were we were in my brother's at my brother's house in like one of his spare bedrooms upstairs and i said something to her and like i was like really shy and nervous and i didn't know what to say and i said something something that came out really stupid and i remember the way she looked at me like what manner of absolutely stupid fucking dumb thing did you just say? I remember that. And like, ugh. Like, I didn't like that at all. But I didn't really see it then, you know? It's one of those things where you don't really notice it until afterwards. Anyway, so I, I lost some girls. Like, you lose these girls, you're walking around the streets and you're just like in pain. You're just angry, you're miserable. It's just like you're pissed off. I was like, what the fuck? What the fuck is actually going on? Then that's when I realised that actually it was about me and it wasn't enough to have stories. I needed to actually work on myself, you know? That's what I realised. And so what did I do? The long and short of it is this. I did, for me to start to really get over this stuff, I did some some courses, man. Something like the Hoffman Process. I don't know if you've heard about that, but Hoffman Process was this course where you go away and you're away for a week or so. I think it's a week or it might be 10 days. And you're in this house, a house with other people, and you can't look at your phones at all. Like, you, you give your phone away. You're just completely cut off from the outside world. And all you're doing is, like, reflecting on yourself as a person all day every day and you're doing these group exercises like there's this one exercise where you're sitting around and you're 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 it's like 30 of us in a massive circle and we're all on our knees and we've got there's pillows in front of us and we've each got a stick like a baseball bat and on the pillow we've all written something about ourselves that we don't want to be true and then you take this baseball bat and you friggin' whack the piece of paper which has that statement on for like an hour and I literally mean an hour and you're hitting it constantly for an hour and everyone's doing it and there might be what 30 of us in a room people start crying it's funny it's like I I could totally flipped out and after a while I was like stop hitting me stop hitting me stop hitting me stop hitting me and I was like that's what I'm doing stop hitting me stop hitting me why because my dad used to fucking hit me didn't he my dad used to hit me and it all came out his fucking anger and his venom and his fucking rage just came the fuck out and like you're there you're crying you're screaming all manner of messed up exercises like that and i did that i did something called landmark forum you know there's a lot of people that think the landmark forums are cult and those people don't know what the hell they're talking about landmark forum was a great thing um it's a weekend thing from like friday morning to monday morning something like that 12 hours a day you're in this room there's like 300 people there and you've got this uh person at the top who's like leading it like the forum leader people will get up and they'll come up and they'll talk about their issues and the forum leader will talk them through their issues and as a result of basically watching all of that it's like it puts your life into perspective because you see people crying about messed up things like there was a woman who killed a her husband and her son in a car crash and she was just in bits there was another woman who was raped by her dad and this is the messed up thing she's crying about being raped by her dad well sexually molested well, well, yeah whatever raped and the forum leader says okay can i say something and she says what and he goes all right 
part of the reason why people feel guilt about these things is because the things that were done to us were actually pleasurable. And then she broke down even more. And I was messed up because the thing is, her dad molested her, but she actually enjoyed it because it physically felt good what he was doing. He was touching her in places that felt good. And then at some point she grows up and she realizes it's wrong. And then she feels guilty for the fact that she enjoyed the thing that was wrong, that she's actually supposed to hate. So then she hates herself for it. And it's like all of this sort of stuff, man. You know, and then like, uh, you get into RSD. RSD are like kind of big on the inner game and whatnot. You know, meditation. I did ayahuasca. I don't know if you know what ayahuasca is, but it's a plant medicine that comes from, I think from the Amazon. And effectively, I mean, I guess you could call it a uh, hallucinogenic drug for lack of a better phrase, but it's like a brew and it's got DMT, dimethyltryptamine in. The long and short of it is that when you take it, you'll like be in another world for like four or five hours and you just be confronting all of your shit. It's like doing that, doing that. You know, a big, big thing that helped me. I always been a person who hates weed, right? Never been a fan of weed. And you know why I wasn't a fan of weed? Because when I would smoke weed, all of my demons would just be thrust into my face, all of them. I don't know why I'm just like paranoid that it's not recording, but it totally is. All of my demons would be thrust into my face, all of them. And I couldn't take that, all of these freaking thoughts. But then actually what I realized is, all right, I did some more work and more research and it's, what people think of as negative experiences like if you take ayahuasca and you have a really traumatic experience or you smoke some weed and you start to freak out all that stuff is inside you it's showing you stuff that's inside you if you just look at it dispassionately it will help like it not just it will help it will go away it's like what you resist persists what you accept uh, fades away so i started doing that so i smoking we're well, not smoking weed but like edible weed and just facing the darkness facing it every day just actually facing the darkness and that is what has got me to where i am today facing the darkness is i have come to realize that it's kind of like this something that i think a lot of guys actually forget like guys who are into game something that we all forget is that there are people who have never heard of game in their lives who have no issues with women there are i grew up with some of these people right no issues with women in any way shape or form you don't need game to be good at women good with women you don't the reason why we need game is because of things that happened to us when we were growing up that basically stunted us socially and then made us unable to express ourselves. So now we feel like, okay, we need help. But you don't necessarily need, you don't need it. I mean, for instance, none of us really need to be the best in the world with women. We only want to be the best because we were in a place where we were absolutely terrible and then it makes you really want this thing that you actually don't have. But you don't actually need to be that great. We don't really need it. And, well, the point I'm making is, I hope I'm not talking in a weird circle, is like, say me. If I didn't grow up constantly being told that I was wrong and that something was wrong with me and feeling like I didn't belong, what's wrong with you? What's wrong with you? We're so ashamed of you. What's wrong with you? Why are you in trouble? What's wrong with you? If I didn't grow up constantly being asked what's wrong with me, I wouldn't have thought there was something wrong with me. So then I would just be myself when I'm with women. I've been fucking fine. Fine. <laughs> fine. Same kind of truth for all of us, really. But, yeah, the stuff that has been the most transformative for me has been facing my demons. I did a challenge called 100 Days of Rejection, where every day for 100 days I faced a different type of rejection to get over the fear of it. I did that, and that was just epic. Epic. <clears throat> I, what did I do? I, I asked a woman for a race and she raced me. I asked a woman to tie my shoelaces. She didn't. I asked a woman for a hug and a kiss and she gave it to me. I asked a guy for a thumb war. He gave me the thumb war. 
I went to a police station and asked if I could sit in a cell. They wouldn't do it. On my birthday, I went into London's business district and I held up a sign saying it's my birthday. I'm giving out free hugs. Some people hugged me and some people didn't, didn't actually. That was really cool. I did loads of stuff. And the whole goal, oh, this was one, this was one. I, I told a businessman that I'd just got out of prison and asked him to help me find a job. I hated that because like, then I had to like play into a negative black stereotype. I really hated that. He told me to try the job centre. That made me feel bad. Um, also went onto a train and asked if people would give me money because I was homeless hated that one as well but um transformative man and you know what was really interesting as well like i'm doing that and the amount of people i had supporting me saying oh my god keep going like keep going please keep doing what you're doing keep going please keep doing what you're doing keep going it was it was amazing it was touching it was incredible it was it was everything i did 100 women in 50 days where every day for 50 days I went out and approached two women. Blogged about that. Again, some people hated it. Loads of people loved it. 100 women in 50 days is what led to the formation of Game Global. Without 100 women in 50 days, there's no Game Global. Without me going out there and posting blogs on Facebook, on Reddit, on Twitter... Without me doing that, there's no game global. You know, and it showed me that there are people who are like you. You know, I got that as well from Landmark Forum and from Hoffman Process. Everybody's actually kind of scared. That's one of the major, 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 major things that I learned is that everyone's scared. It's not just you. We live in a world where everyone is pretending. A analogy I always give is like when I was a teenager and I was a virgin, but I thought everyone else around me wasn't a virgin because everybody used to lie and everyone said, I'm not a virgin, I'm not a virgin. I have sex all the time, I'm not a virgin. Everyone said that. And then you believe it, but like as an adult, you grow up and you look back and you're like, no, they were actually all virgins. Everyone was lying. That's actually what the world is like. Everybody's lying. Everyone's lying. Everybody is lying. Everybody's scared. Everybody. It's not just me and it's not just you. Every single person is actually scared. Everyone's scared. That's something I realised. I realised that everybody is scared. And if everybody is scared, why not be the person who's actually going to help people overcome their scaredness? Scaredness? Is that even a word? I don't know. But it's true. Everybody's freaking scared. They all are. You're not alone. So, I suppose that's my story. It is my story. The more I face the darkness and the demons, the more the darkness and the demons fade away into the background. Who knew? Who knew? Who knew? Who knew? Who knew? Who knew? And uh, am I rambling? Maybe I am. Maybe I am. Looking kind of jacked though, aren't I? Look at these muscles. <laughs> <laughs> look at the muscles but yeah man so there we go that is me and my story hope you find it inspirational i hope you hope you take something from it and also hope you have yourself an absolutely wonderful day ta-ta see you later goodbye au revoir and arrivederci ciao for now and a yasemin asai which apparently means good night in japanese this is Kieran and I'm here to let you know that I am currently offering free 30 minute consultations to the readers of this blog. If there is any area of your romantic and sexual life that isn't quite working for you, get in touch with me and let's have a chat. Um, it'll be about 30 minutes or so. We'll go through your entire situation. I'll let you know where you're going right and where you're going wrong. And together we will decide if working together long term will be a good fit for both of us. Right now, you're about to see some testimonials from some of my previous clients who will be talking about the great results that I've gotten for them. Have a look at that. Take it easy and goodbye. Oh, yeah, I was. Yeah, I was really nervous. Um, mm. You know, I, I think it was I think I think the hardest part is I think the hardest part is just admitting that you need help. And seeking and, you know, and taking the initiative to, to get help. But, um, you know, I think it was a, I, 
I don't regret it at all. I think it was probably one of the one of the best decisions I ever made. And you know, once once we started going and you know doing doing the work, it was just I mean, it was just life changing. With you, I learned to trust myself more as well. Because mm. I don't know, like, again, like part of the doubts I was ha- I was having with myself is like I didn't trust myself. I didn't like trust I could actually do. Um, like like say like you, you set me in some tasks to do as well during this uh, coaching period. I didn't trust myself to complete them. Again, I was stuck in in that past mindset. And uh, yeah, like, so what I've learned is like to trust myself. And again, like if I'm going to take action, it's going to have to be in, like you have to be like 100% in, like all in. Because even before, like I would approach, I'll be like, uh, I'll, I'll be like, 70 percent in and then i'm like 30 percent kind of like mm. you know what i mean yeah, yeah so yeah. It's like, it definitely like taught me to be more sure of myself even if i am wrong but at least i'm like sure of myself and i can learn from that as well isn't it? Mm. and uh what else yeah and also just to again positive self-talk like that's so underrated and i like i never used to do it as much as I am doing it now. And it's definitely making a difference. So that's one thing I have to get off you actually. Uh, what else? But yeah, yeah, at least, <laughs> there's a lot more I've learned from you, but probably can't remember most of it right now. Um, but yeah, mostly it's to take action, you know? Um, I was, part, again, part of the mindset I had was a very passive mindset. A um, lot of mental masturbation, Let's just reading and watching stuff without actually going out there and putting it into action. But I was never good enough. If if to 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 explain that better, I was never. I was always the type of person that women wanted, women and people in general wanted to be around with. But I was never taken seriously. Uh, so, you know, yeah. I was like, women, women think I'm a good friend. Women think I'm funny. Women think I'm so good. Women think I'm so cool. They all want to be around, but they would never even cross their mind the possibility of seeing me as you know a romantic partner, a sexual partner, a, a, a whatever. Mm. Um, so I was always surrounded by a lot of people, but they never took me seriously enough. Mm. And I think it was, I never took myself seriously enough to to get that to get that um, get that from people. If that makes sense. No, it does. It makes a lot of sense. Mm. You know what? I've been there before, and one thing I always mm. hated was there'd be some situation where there's a woman, and you're firmly in a friend zone. It's like he's my friend. Mm. He's my friend. He's my mm. friend. But if you were to try and kiss her she'd be like revolts, like, Ugh, like, Ugh. Yeah. so like on the yeah. one hand, she really likes yeah. you, but on the other hand, yeah. you kind of disgust her because the yeah. idea yeah. of doing that, like that's repulsive. Yeah. Like, Ugh. Yeah. And I never really yeah. liked that. Yeah. So man, that was me all my life. That was me all my life. That was me since I was like fucking 12. Just, uh, just, I was just had my best friends were girls and they would friends on me and I would fall in love with them and then they would reject me. And it was just over and over and over being friends and being friends all the time. Mm, I hear. So, what specifically then about me? What was like the lesson that I gave you or the lessons that went a long way to changing? It's like the big like epiphany or something where you're like, mm-hmm. oh my God, I've been doing this wrong or I've been seeing this mm-hmm. wrong. You mm-hmm. know, what was that for you? Um, I th- uh, there's been, I think there's been multiple, there's just, it's just ongoing. There's just little things all the time. Yeah. Like a lot of the times when, you know, I ask you questions, you give me advice about specific situations. It's, it's, it's generally really good advice that helps me fix little steps along the way. Mm-hmm. So it's like a constant kind of like bit by bit by bit improvement by improvement. But I think the one big thing that overarches everything. Yeah. Like the, like the one big thing that overrules, um, everything in general regarding this whole journey which is the one thing that I think I've gotten from you that I've never got from anybody else was um, the real belief in that I can do things my way. Yeah. Like I can, like I can really, really do things by being myself. And I think it was that one time that we had the long talk um, over voicemails, voice notes that you said that, you know, you can see in me that I'm a performer. You can see in me that when I can talk, people are going to listen. You can see in me that I have what it takes in me to do great things. That was almost like a wake up call. That was almost like, 
a real, a real, really, really important, powerful lesson when I was like, okay, shit, this is legit and I, I need to make it work. And then that was almost like a before and after where, you know, everything came from a different place because, you know, you can get, you can get dating advice, you can read books, you can watch videos, you can watch YouTube coaches, you can watch all these guys. And it's just like, it's really good advice that is standardized for everyone. Yeah, like, you know, there's certain things that everyone can learn that isn't going to work for everyone. There's things that work. There's things that don't work. Learning is always good. But from you, I got that personal relation, like, like I could see relatable between you and me. And when you said that, that really ignited something in me. And then that was a before and after simply because from that point on, I was doing things and I still am doing things from a point of the maximum expression of where I really believe that I can be. So I'm not embodying a line. I'm not embodying uh, some, some scripted routine. I'm just, I'm just channeling things through the, through the being that I know I have inside me. Yeah. And I think that's, that's the main thing that I got from you. I don't know. Part of me thought like, okay, I'm part of this group. Let me just see if I can get, as much motivation from them to actually take action mm. and improvement in this area. But that was kind of, um, let's say it didn't work out. I, I didn't feel that fire, that, uh, that drive to actually take as much action as I needed to. Mm. And then I'm pretty sure uh, some of your clients in the group started talking about how they like how your coaching was helping them. Mm. And, Again, I didn't right away. I didn't think, okay, maybe I should try some coaching. I just thought, like, let me just stick to this group. Mm-hmm. Let me do my, you know, my one or two approaches per week, and then that'll be done. And eventually, I'll get someone. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, I'm pretty sure this was the spark. Uh, one of your, one of your clients definitely started talking about their experience and how your coaching has helped them. And to be honest with you, I've always wanted to get some coaching from someone, but I didn't really, because most of it is like, uh, what's, what do they say? Like oil salesmen. Like they just want to. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I could tell, I could tell that you and Joe actually, actually cared about making a difference in people's, you know, dating life, especially if it's dry. Like, mm. but yeah, you know what I mean? Like, so that was definitely a big motivator. And I knew I knew I could definitely get better than I would by myself, mm. which is like it's like um, I don't know. I think it was probably a pride thing for me. It's like I like getting coaching. Sometimes people are like, yeah, I don't need coaching. You know, I can do this mm. by myself. But um, what I want to ask is then, so as a result of the help and support that I've given you. What changes occurred in your relationships with women as a result? Um, I, I, I definitely feel more of the, more of the abundance mentality. And, you know, I don't feel like, I don't feel like I'm burdening someone by having a conversation with them mm. anymore. I feel like, I, I feel like if I, if I want to go talk to someone, it's not a big deal. And if anything, I can make their life, you know, make their day better, make their day, make their night, just add, you know, inject fun into their, their evening or, or just, or just their day. Um, and, and it's okay. I, I'm allowed to talk to anybody I want to. I'm, and there's nothing wrong with that. And it, it's okay. And, and the outcome doesn't matter. Um, because I can just, I can just take it or leave it. I mean, I can, I can go into, you know, on a, on a first date, I used to be super nervous, you know, sitting in my car, you know, I'd, I'd show up like super early because I didn't want to be late. And, uh, you know, I'd be sitting in my car, just, you know, stressing out. And, and then I would walk in and I'd be trying to calm down and I just couldn't. And, now I just go into it and I just say, you know, I'm, I'm going to have a fun evening. This beats sitting on my couch for the most part. And 
I can just go into this and have fun and, and meet somebody new and, and see what happens. All right, there's um, something you said that was very powerful, which is that you said that you feel like you're not burdening people by talking to them anymore. That's yeah. kind of powerful. That means then that in the past when you spoke to someone, or if you had to think about speaking to someone, you felt like you were a leech that's basically making their life worse. Not hugely worse, but you know, you're not making their life better. You're a burden. You're annoying. You're a nuisance. You know, go away. Leave me alone which is actually a terrible way to see yourself as a person, you know, but a lot of people do. Like I used to think that back in the past as well, but now you actually see yourself as a guy who, when you speak to somebody, it's like, ha, ah, Matt spoke to me. Ah, oh, that was great. Like now my day has been lifted. Now my life is better because I've actually had the experience of this guy. And that, that's not a small thing that you've actually said. And you know, something I've noticed as well from speaking to you, you didn't actually say this, but I'm going to. I have noticed that you seem to be, quote unquote, fornicating with women a lot more these days. You do seem to be doing that. And you know, another thing I've noticed as well, you're, you said, you've told me two instances recently where you actually turned women down because you weren't, you know, you, you, you weren't feeling it, basically. And that is definitely in my opinion a sign of a abundance mentality because you wouldn't have done that a few months ago you wouldn't have done it at all i i don't think i ever did that until you know uh, until we started to, in, until we started working together mm -hmm. i think any, i i mean i'm just just thinking back at you know every instance of my life i mean very few i i I was, I was thinking, I was like, I don't think I've ever broken up with anyone. Mm. You know, I, I don't think I ever, you know, dated anyone where I was the person who decided that, you know, this isn't, you know, this isn't working or this isn't what I want. I, I, this, this should, should be over. This is not good for me. I was always just stuck in this, you know, scarcity mentality where, you know, anybody that was going to give me the time of day, I just had to, you know, grab onto them and, don't let go because this is my last chance. And now I, I'm kind of just of the, it's, it's just, it's, I mean, it's refreshing. It's adds less stress to the situation. I just, I just feel that, you know, I can go into something and take it or leave it. It's, it's okay. It's okay to walk away. It's okay to decide that it's not working out or that, you know, this is not somebody that you want to be with and there's nothing wrong with that.